I'm very honored and I'm very uh, blessed to know Gino Geraci. Gino is, um, he has been uh, really a, a father to me. He has um, um, shown me a lot. You know, when you're, a, when you're a teen, you know what it's like to have teenagers. And then when they move out and they're, they're ready to move out, and, you know, they think they know everything. They think... Um, they, they can tell you what to do and how to do things. And until they go out and live on their own, get married, have children, then they come back and they realize how wonderful you are. And so that's, um, that's kind of what's going on with Chino. Um, I, I just am so thankful for him and all that he's done. His philosophy of ministry here is the same thing that we've adapted out there, which is to welcome all of those who the Lord is bringing to plant other churches, embrace them, and uh, let them know that there's, uh, uh, you know, that we love them and that we're friends with them. And we've done the same thing out there. So it's been wonderful. That's all I want to say about, about that now. So we'll get to our study. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning and for this time. Lord, we thank you for, um, again, that we get to have this place to open your word and to read and to hear what it is that you have to say. Lord, it is you that we need to hear from. And I lift up every single person in this room every single person that might be listening by uh, the internet, every single person that might be listening by a a podcast. And Lord, you know their heart perfectly. You know their situation um, perfectly. And and I ask that you would just minister to them right where they are. Give them the wisdom, Lord, that they're asking for. Father, give them the courage that they need. And Lord, I pray that you would help them, Lord, to take bold steps of faith. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as I was praying about, you know, what to share uh, with all of you guys this week, uh, I think the Lord just wanted me to remind you of what an amazing God that we have. Our God is a loving Father. That's the title of today's message, Our Loving Father. So we're going to look at Luke um, chapter 15. We're going to take a look at what is commonly called the story of the, or the parable of the prodigal son. However, I think it is more fitting to be called the story or the parable of our loving father. And although we're going to be concentrating on verses 11 through 24 uh, this morning, the context is actually set up in verses 1 through 3. So take a look at verse 1. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, that is to Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, So stop right there. On display almost immediately is the horrible attitude of the religious leaders. They have expressed exactly how they feel about people who, in their estimation, are sinners that are outside, again, by their estimation, of the kingdom of God or somehow maybe beyond God's love. Unfortunately, I would say this same attitude can also be in many religious people today where they see people outside of, you know, God's realm of love or at least their realm of love. They have this this attitude towards them that is not favorable or loving whatsoever. And um, when I say religious people, I'm going to define that as the Lord Jesus defines them in Matthew 23, 27 when he says that they are whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and all clean, cleanness. So uh, uncleanness, they look great to all of us, right? You would see them at church and they would seem like a very nice person. They would seem like a very well together person, but inside they are dead. Inside they, they, they are full of anger. They are full of, of um, you know, just nastiness towards people who are... Um, who seem to be far from the Lord, as funny as it is to say it, but you know, it is very true. He also says, the Lord says that these people draw near to me with their mouth in Matthew 15, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So since the religious leaders are putting their attitude uh, towards these sinners, if you will, on display, Jesus then decides to put our heavenly Father's attitude towards these people on display. So the Lord Jesus then goes on to give them three parables to show them how God thinks about the lost and how God feels and thinks about the sinful. Now, you've been with Gino long enough. 
I'm sure he's explained to you a parable is an earthly story that reveals a heavenly truth. So in other words, what Jesus is trying to do with these men is give them insight as to what is going on in the heart of the individual who is, you know, who they're considering as a sinner or the, or the individual who Jesus is about to describe, but also in the heart and the mind of our heavenly father towards someone who is in that condition. So first I want to point out here is at the end of the first two parables, because we're not going to go over them, but look at the end of the first two parables. Look at verse 7. Jesus says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Every single one of us need to let that sink in. Let that sink in. And then in Luke 15, 10, look at verse 10. Likewise, he says, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the attitude of our heavenly father, of our loving father. This is what Jesus is revealing or trying to reveal to these men, that the heavenly father, listen now, loves the lost. He loves them. He cares for them. And of course, Jesus has a lot more to say about it. But this is the context that sets up the last parable. So next we are given insight as to what is happening inside the mind, again, of someone who is walking away from the Lord. So look at verse 11 now in Luke chapter 15. It says, And a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. So the first thing that we see here happening inside someone uh, who is in this condition is that covetousness has been born in his heart. Covetousness has been born in his heart. Covetousness is interesting because it has a way of masking itself to us as a legitimate concern as a legitimate concern. But listen, make no mistakes about it. Covetousness has its roots in our self-centered nature. And no doubt, the enemy is good at preying upon our selfish nature, tempting us, inflaming us to desire what we don't have or to be discontent with our current situation versus desiring what we um, don't have or being content uh, and trusting God with our current situation. You know, there are two kinds of discontentment in the world, if you will. Two kinds of discontentment. There is a godly discontentment, a godly discontentment where God is stirring you to do something more, that he wants you to step up, that he wants you to, you know, take a step of faith. Sometimes I've, I've described it as like spiritual cabin fever, where, you know, you come and you sit and you've been just, you know, you've desired the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, and you've been doing that. And now you've moved on to solid food, and you're consuming that solid food. You have your senses exercised. You know, the word has trained you on what to smell, what to taste, what to listen to, what to say. The word, you've been trained, and now you're in this mode, and you've just been sitting in this place, and you are just a fat, happy sheep but there's something wrong inside and, you're, and you feel it. You're feeling restless. The characteristics of godly discontentment is one that looks at faith, looks at sacrifice, looks at selflessness and hardship and accepts them as terms of advancement. You hear what I'm saying? Godly discontentment will embrace faith, it will embrace hardship, it will embrace difficulty, it will embrace sacrifice, it will embrace selfish, selflessness as terms of the agreement in order for you to advance, to do more what the Lord wants you to do. That's godly discontentment. And listen, the result of godly discontentment is tremendous growth where there's fruit in your life, that you bear tremendous fruit in your life, and there's a reward for you. There's a reward for you. There's a reward for your children. There's a reward for your grandchildren because you have taken this step. You have allowed this godly discontentment to, um, 
you know, to grow and, to, and you've acted upon it. Then there is a worldly discontentment. The characteristics of worldly discontentment are immediate gratification, immediate gratification, abandonment, easy living, selfishness, where the result is either a clear path behind them or before them of destruction. The reason why I'm telling you this is because when you are dealing with people, when you're talking with people, or even if you're looking at it for yourself, how do you know if you are dealing with godly discontentment or how do you know if you're dealing with worldly discontentment? If, we're, if, if what you want is immediate gratification, look out. If what you want is, is um, easy living, look out. Those are not characteristics of godly discontentment. This is why I always say that the idea of the American dream without Jesus in one's life is a very dangerous proposition. A very dangerous proposition. Most everyone remembers the part of the Declaration of Independence, right, that states that we have the right to life, liberty, and what the the pursuit of happiness. But my friends, that's taken out of, the, of, of context. The document actually reads this way. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they, have, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If God is removed from that equation, look out. Then it becomes a hedonistic lifestyle. You know the scripture, the Holy Spirit tells us through the Apostle Timothy that godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, there was nothing in the Jewish law that would forbade a son to ask for his inheritance while the father was still alive. However, just like today, it is more respectful, right, to wait at least until, what, the parent passes away before you ask for the inheritance. If a child came up to you, if your child came up to you today and demanded your inher their inheritance, what would you say? Well, so some of you might say, sure, fine, here you go. I've got a penny. That's all I got, right? But for some of you, you might actually have something to pass down. What would you think about your child? You would think they're struggling. There's something going on there. They're wrapped up in self. They're being selfish. They're being disrespectful. Maybe they're very mean-spirited mean or they're being ungrateful. Some of you may even know someone or you've, have, you've heard of someone who has done this and it's caused irreparable harm to the family. But listen, when the enemy preys upon our selfish nature, he fuels it. He inflames it. There is almost no reasoning with the person who is locked in that mindset. They've been blinded and lured by the next thing that we're gonna look at, the promise of of sin. Look at verse 13. It says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The Holy Spirit tells us in Hebrews 11.25, you guys know the scripture, that sin is pleasurable for a season, isn't it? It is. It's pleasurable for a season. But you know, at the same time, uh, my former pastor, actually, I, I grew up in North Denver. I came from Tom Stipe's church. And uh, I remember sitting at Tom's church, and he would always say, sin makes you stupid. Sin makes you stupid. And he would say, repeat after me, class, sin makes you stupid. And we would say, sin makes you stupid. But, you know, it gets beaten into your head that sin does make you stupid. It's one of the things that sin does, among many things that it does. People do the dumbest things, and they call it fun. People do the, the, the there are even TV shows out there, right, where they're filming people who are doing stupid things, very harmful things, and they're on display for all the world to see. Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, there is an insanity in sin that seems to paralyze the image of God within us and liberate the animal inside. You see, sin promises to give us fun, excitement, happiness, but there is always, always, always a cost involved that far exceeds money. The payment for sin's enticement is the soul of the individual. 
the payment for sin's enticement on you is your soul. Make no mistake, there is a wage for sin, and it is, it is very costly. I think a person pays the price with his or her innocence, pays that price with their dignity, pays that price with their worth, their self-respect, even a peace of mind. When a person is so wrapped up in sin, they don't have a peace of mind. You know the scripture. If you have Matthew chapter 16, Mark, turn to Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And you see it just as well as I do. People are exchanging their soul for the smallest things. Sin cannot deliver what it promises. You should write that down. That's deep. Sin cannot deliver what it promises. That needs to sink into our heads. Sin cannot deliver what it promises. It can initiate pleasure. But meanwhile, it's deteriorating your life. It can initiate pleasure, but it rips apart your soul and your spirit. God's word is true. Just as he spoke to Adam in Genesis 2, right? He says, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did he die the moment he ate of it? He died a slow but sure death. And that's exactly what sin does. Another word of God that is true about sin is that it enslaves us. Sin promises freedom, but what it actually delivers to you, to us, is enslavement. Look at verse 14. It says, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want, and then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and, and no one gave him anything. Sin promises good times. Hey, good times! You know the song, good times, good times, good times, good times. That's my Peter Frampton reference, yes. But what it actually delivers is hard times. What sin actually delivers is hard times. Sin took this young man away from the blessing of being a son and delivered the hardship and reality of being a slave. Jesus is speaking a parable. He is trying to give every single person who is listening to this, then and there, and in the ages to come, insight as to what is taking place, actually as to what is happening from God's perspective, what is actually happening in the heart, in the mind, in the soul of the individual. The first trial that came along in this guy's, in this young man's life was a famine. He had nothing to stand on. There was no character in him whatsoever that could sustain him. There was nothing that he had in his life. And he just, everything crumbled underneath him. He had no hope for the future. Where were all the people that he partied with? Why didn't they help him? Why are they not mentioned here? So what did this man learn? And what do people learn when they go down this road? They learn that the kinds of friends that money can buy you are really not the kinds of friends that you want. Guaranteed, when he was sleeping around, hanging out at the bars, if you will, oh, there were people who were all around him who were, you know, wanted to be his friend, who wanted to help him spend his money, excited about what he was doing, excited about him. They were probably buttering him up, you know, showering him with compliments, doing all sorts of things. But as soon as the money was gone, they're gone. It says there was no one there to help him. No one was there to be found. Sin promised this man freedom, but it made him a slave because this is what sin does. 
Sin says to us, oh, you know, if I could just be free, if I just wasn't married to this person, or if I just had a different job, or you know, even, even if I just wasn't a Christian, well, then, then I could be free. You understand, that's some twisted thinking that the enemy throws at us. If I just wasn't a Christian, well, then, then I could actually be free of this, of this guilt. That is some twisted logic that the enemy likes to throw at us. You know, Jews weren't allowed to touch pigs. They weren't allowed really to come near them. Pigs were detestable to them. And I don't know if you've ever watched pigs eat. Maybe some of you grew up on a farm. Maybe some of you, you've, you've just fed a pig. But it's not a pretty sight, right? It's, it's actually a very um, nasty thing. This guy is looking at their food and wanting it. How low does a person have to go before they snap out of it? You, I think you know just as well as I do that, that different people have different degrees of low. You know, you can go to a, a jail or a prison, and I've been to many of them. And just because a person, you would think that a, a person being in jail is a low point, and for some people, listen, it's not low enough. It's not low enough. It is sad when a person does not see how low they are. They cannot see how their sin has not made them better. It has not made them free. It has made them a slave. The Lord's words are true. If you have John chapter 8, Mark, turn to John chapter 8. When the Lord says in verse 31 uh, to the Jews, it says, who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, they said, well, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, and he said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So the Holy Spirit tells us through the Apostle James that in James chapter 1 that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings what? Death. It brings forth death. Understand how sin begins. It begins through covetous desire, how it is sustained through a willful, continual act until it is full grown, until it is blown up, and then it brings forth death. So again, the sad thing here is the religious leaders did not see, they could not see, they refused to see how they were in bondage. And the same goes for so many people today. They refuse to see, they can't see how they are in bondage. And listen, Jesus is speaking to religious people. It said at the beginning of, of verse 31 in chapter 8 that they believed in him. He's not speaking to people who are outside of the realm of God, if you will. He's speaking to people who should know better. Many people think that by simply going to church that they're free. And that is just a lie. Going to church does not mean you are free. Growing up in a Christian family does not mean that you are free. Trust me, I know, I have eight wonderful children who I have worked very hard to disciple them. And my wife and I, we worked very hard to disciple them. They, are, they had to, each one of them, come to a place where they abandoned their sin and asked the Lord Jesus to come into their lives. Growing up in a Christian home does not mean you are free. I can tell you that is true. Dating a Christian does not mean you are free. This is why Jesus personalizes it here in John chapter eight. He says, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That means every single person has to come to that decision on their own. Your spouse can't make that decision for you. Your boyfriend can't make that decision for you. Your girlfriend can't make that decision for you. Your church can't make that decision for you. Your family cannot make that decision for you. 
I have to make the decision to trust Jesus that what he says is true, that I am a sinner, and only he has the power to save me. Let me tell you, it's been interesting since I've been here um, this week. I grew up here. You know, this is my roots. This is where I'm from. And uh, I've been driving back uh, in, in the North Denver area looking at some of the homes that I grew up in. And uh, just remembering where I was. You know, I grew up with, uh, with drugs in my house. I grew up, my whole family was involved in, in doing uh, things that they shouldn't have been doing. I had access to drugs at a very, very young age. I got radically saved when I was 15. I was doing things in elementary school, junior high school, that people don't even attempt until they get into college. And going back and looking at where I, where I lived and, and just remembering what the Lord has done in my life and where he has brought me, I know that I am a sinner and that only he has the power to save me. But listen, when a person refuses to acknowledge this truth, what, what happens? It breaks God's heart. When we refuse to acknowledge that what Jesus is saying here is true, it literally breaks God's heart. When a person comes to their, but when a person comes to their senses and realizes that it is true, the most beautiful thing in the entire universe takes place. Look at verse 17. It says, but when he came to himself. Listen, those words right here are some of the most beautiful words you will ever read. This means that when he came to his senses, meaning he looked at his situation and he looked at everything that was going on and you know what he did? He realized one thing, that he was wrong. He was wrong. Can you admit very easily that you're wrong? Maybe you've been in an argument with your spouse. How hard is it to admit that you were wrong? Maybe you disciplined your child in a way that you shouldn't have. How hard is it for you to admit that you were wrong? This man was in a place and he realized he was wrong. This means he came to his senses. He was 100% wrong. He had the wrong attitude. He had the wrong heart. He had the wrong outlook. Everything about who he was and what he was doing was wrong. It was like Keith Green's song. You guys familiar with Keith Green? Love Keith Green. He was a musician in the 70s. He wrote a song. But he, in the, one of his songs, he said, it was like waking up from the longest dream. That, you know, now I really see that, that he had like clouds hanging on, like, like curtains on his eyes. But with the touch of the Lord Jesus, he, he rolled them away. And this young man said, when he came to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I perish with hunger. That is such a key moment, everybody. God will allow a person to run their course so that they will get to this place where they say, I perish with hunger. That is a key moment. It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to allow someone to get to that place. It's hard to allow them to get to that point, to watch them destroy themselves and to get to that point. Why? Why is it hard? Here's one of the reasons why I think it's hard. And understand, I'm speaking in generalities here. I'm not saying this is every situation. I'm speaking in generalities. And generally speaking, I think this is true. And it is that we think that we are somehow more compassionate than God. To allow someone to run that course and to, uh, to let them and then to and just watch them. Understand the Lord is allowing this person to run this course till they get to this moment where they say, I perish with hunger. If I step in, if you step in, it's very possible I could get in God's way. Get in God's way of this person getting to that point where they are finally ready, finally, finally, finally ready to repent of their sin. So listen, we have to be careful. 
We have to be very careful. Sin brings a person to a place of hunger, to a place of thirst, to a place where, where they are willing, where we are willing to hear the Lord's call. And what is the Lord's call? That if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, that out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You understand? When a person is not at their lowest low, they can hear that a thousand times and it will never sink in. It, will never, it won't have an effect on them. It'll be just like water on a duck's back. They'll never, they won't get it. But when a person hears the Lord's call, when they're finally at that point where they hear the Lord say, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When the soul is genuinely hungry, when the soul is genuinely thirsty, it wants nothing more than to be relieved. So now, as key as this moment is, it would not be possible, listen, without the goodness of our Heavenly Father. It would not be possible without the goodness of our Heavenly Father. Make no mistake, repentance is rooted in the goodness of God. Repentance is rooted in the goodness of our Heavenly Father. If God wasn't good, there would be no reason to repent. If God wasn't good, there would be no motive, if you will. But because God is good, we're able to say to the individual, God loves you. And he is willing to show you mercy. He is willing to, to show you grace. He is willing to show you joy, that he is willing to give you peace, that he is willing to give you rest, that he is willing to restore what the enemy has taken away and destroyed in your life. This young man was remembering all of this that was true for who? For the servants of his father. All right? The servants of his father. So he says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, verse 19, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Get this now. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, a lot of definitions have been, given, have been given about repentance or for repentance. Its simplest definition is, means to just change one's mind. It's been pointed out, and I think rightfully so, this young man went from a heart that said, give me, to a heart that said, make me. Make me like one of your servants. He said, give me my inheritance. And now all he can think to say is, Father, make me like one of your servants. What a beautiful change. That's what we're looking for in people. That's, that's a very key moment. Repentance needs to go beyond tears to action. I'm sure when this guy was wallowing in the mud, when he was craving the pig's food, when none of his uh, so-called friends were coming around, when no, one was, when no one was willing to give him anything, I guarantee you he was probably in tears. Have you ever been in a very, very low place and you have just been in just, all you can do is cry. Cry, 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 cry. You're in tears. But listen, repentance has to go beyond tears. It has to go towards action. You have to take action. A person has to take action action. Whoever you're counseling or whoever you're encouraging, you need to watch for action. You need to encourage them to make a change. When someone comes to you and they've sinned and they're crying, let them cry. Let them cry. Let them get it out. Wait till the tears are gone and then you can have a conversation with them. Listen, if you get suckered in to feeling sorry for them by listening to them cry, you're being manipulated. You're being manipulated. Don't fall for it. Why? You want to know why? Because God doesn't fall for it with you. You can come to God and you can cry, cry, cry about the sin that you committed, the sin, sin, sin you've committed. You cry and cry and cry and cry and the Lord will let you cry and then he'll come to a place and he'll say, okay, are you finished? Are you done? Are you ready to talk change now? We need to have that same approach. 
and understanding and helping others. Now, this is, I'm not saying to be heartless. I'm not saying that we don't care. I'm just saying that this is how you need to think about it. This is how we need to think about it. And then ask them, what are you going to do about the situation? What are you going to change? Change needs to take place. And when he did, his father, listen now, this is, a, this is beautiful. His father far out, uh, far exceeded his expectations. Look at verse 20. It says, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to the father, father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. And then look, the father just interrupts him and doesn't even let him finish his rehearsed sentence, his rehearsed thing. The father interrupts him and he says, you know, uh, bring out the best robe and put it on and put, it, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive. Again, now I don't know, have you ever been so worked up, you ever been so, you know, um, maybe angry at somebody and you're trying to communicate to them and you can't and you sound like an idiot. You're like, I just can't. You know, you, you just can't form a sentence. Or like when you're dreaming and you're trying to talk and you can't talk in a dream. You know that feeling? I think this is exactly what's going on here. There is full emotion happening here. He can't even finish his sentence. And I even think the father's crying. You know, and he says, bring out the best. Now listen, if you read this like, but the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on, there's something wrong with you. The father is broken, excited that his son has returned. Bring out the fatted calf here, kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. You gotta love, uh, you know, the, 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 the English people. And they began to be merry. That's, that's what we describe all the time with each other, right? Let's go and be merry. So they began to be merry. But listen, when a person comes back to the Lord, here's what happens. God far out, far exceeds, uh, out exceeds their expectation. Because here's the thing. The enemy will do everything that he can to keep a person from coming back to God. He will lie. He will lie. He will lie. He will lie to you. He will tell you that God is angry with you. He will tell you that God is just waiting with a lightning bolt to strike you dead. And I'm sure this young man was thinking that his father had some choice words for him. But listen, what are you reading? Look again at what you're reading. You're reading a parable, an earthly story that reveals a heavenly truth. Jesus is trying to teach these men, his disciples, these religious leaders, that this is how God feels towards people who are distant from him. People who are lost, if you will. Jesus is trying to get into our heads that God is not sitting up there with the lightning bolt, but that God's heart breaks and that he's just waiting. And he's watching. He's watching for all those who have left him to come back, to return to him. Now God's not gonna make somebody come back, but listen, he's watching. He's watching. And isn't it amazing? The father was the first person to see him. And he ran to him. And he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Oh, he just, how many of you love to kiss your children? I just love to kiss my children and my grandchildren. In fact, it's one of my favorite routines when the kids are leaving is you just smother the grandkids with kisses where they're getting in the cars like, oh, grandpa loves you, loves you, and then they're, you know, it's just, you just gotta do it. He ran to this, his son and he kissed him and no doubt there was tears. No doubt in my mind whatsoever that there was joy. And all the lies that the enemy had been telling this son, all the things that had been gone in a moment's notice gone in a moment's notice. Our Heavenly Father is not angry. What did Jesus say back in verse 7 and 10? That there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 of us who are fat and happy. There is joy, verse 10, in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, re who repents. 
Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father to us. Jesus is teaching these men, these religious leaders, and us that the Father goes, listen now, beyond justice to mercy. Our God goes beyond justice to mercy. You want to know the most powerful words that changed Levi's life, Matthew the tax collector? When Jesus said in his defense to the religious leaders, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Warren Wiersbe said, had the boy been dealt with according to the law, there would have been a funeral and not a feast. Yes, the father loves his wayward son, and he wanted him to know his love. But, you know, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21 and dealing with the rebellious son, if he would have not heeded, if a rebellious uh, child does not heed the voice of his parent, the parent can take him out and stone him. The Pharisees, they're throwing verbal stones. They would like nothing better than to see this person destroyed, come under the uh, weight of the law, and be dealt with. But you want to hear something mind blowing? This is mind-blowing. Jesus tells these men that part of the reason this father ran to hug and to kiss his wayward son, listen now, was to protect him. It was to cover him. If he would have been, if anyone else would have seen him before the father, they would have taken him outside the city, they would have caused a riot, and they would have stoned him. But the father, knowing that, waited every day, every moment, watching until his son pierced the horizon. And then he ran and he covered him because no one would dare try to harm the father, hurt the father while trying to harm the son. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus is telling these men that he is going to do. Listen, for them, that he is going to cover them. He is going to go to a cross. He is going to shed his blood. And he is going to cover them and take a beating for them that they deserve. That's what he's revealing in this parable. That he is going to die for them. That he loves them that Jesus is gonna take the death sentence for them so that they could be cared for. This is your loving father. This is your loving father. We have every reason to celebrate our loving father because there is no other father like him. Let me close with this. Psalm 103, verse 10, you know the scripture. It says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows your frame, and he knows that you are dust. Let's pray. Lord, I, I just lift up every person to you here this morning. And Lord, you know perfectly where they are. You know their heart. You know if they feel so distant from you, Lord. Lord, you don't look at the outward appearance. You're not looking, as you're going through every chair here in this room, you're not looking at how well-dressed we are. You're not looking at how together we seem to appear. But Lord, you are piercing deeply into the heart of every person. And you know what is going on. And listen, you cannot hide from God. And why would you? You cannot hide from him. He sees where you are. He sees what's going on inside your heart. And Lord, I ask that you would just minister to them at this moment how much that you love them and how much that you care for them.
I'm going to ask you to stay in, in an attitude of prayer. We're going to uh, worship a little. You can stand, you can sit, you can kneel. Whatever you do, I want to encourage you to just come before the Lord this morning. Confess your sin, your distance from God, and embrace Him. Know that He's running to you. And listen, let's just do this. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm just going to have everybody repeat it after me. And it'll be for those who are distant from God. But let's just pray it together. Everyone repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I come back to you. Please forgive me, Lord. Fill my heart again, Lord. In Jesus' name.